Uh, I was working as a journalist in Egypt, and uh, the topic of my research was um, the evolution of press censorship in Egypt. Uh, in the years, because you told me you became a journalist in about 98, so the years between 98 and when you did your fellowship, as, as a journalist in Egypt, how did the censorship and then the controls over what you wrote, how did that impact you to lead you to choose that as a topic? Um, there is, uh, um, as a journalist, you're, you're, there's kind of these uh, known red lines. And um, the, the red lines when I started working as a journalist in Egypt in 1998 were uh, the presidency, his family and their wealth, they, that was off limits. The military, completely off limits. And um, a Muslim Christian sectarian conflict uh, was another topic off limits. As the years moved on, there, there have been ways in which those red lines have been chipped away at, uh, except maybe for the military until the revolution happened in, in 2011. Uh, but the presidency was slowly being chipped away at in terms you couldn't, before you couldn't draw political cartoons of the president and what cartoonists started to do is they drew, um, towards the end of his rule, they started drawing cartoons of him from behind. So you can kind of guess that he's the president without showing his face. And it's just this, this ways of kind of uh, playing in those gray areas that expanded this arena for expression in, in Egypt. Um, and it, was, it, was, it, it happened slowly and gradually and over time. And, uh, and it was a collective effort, not just among journalists, but among uh, you know, media creators, social media. At the time, the internet was growing. Satellite television was a new forum for media. Uh, and um, the regime didn't um, um, felt that, in a way, uh, allowing moderately more space for expression, not too much, but just a little bit more space for ex expression, was a way uh, of, of kind of being a pressure valve. So people can vent. Uh, and um, but not too much. Yeah, not too much mm -hmm. uh, within limits, but in a way it was it was um, and uh, it wasn't seen as too dangerous because at the end uh, we have the army, we have the police, and we rig elections. So there's nothing that can change. You know, we have all the power, so you can say whatever you want. Uh, it's like banging your head on the wall. So people didn't consider it the freedom of speech or the freedom of the press. People always called it, we have the, f the freedom to shout, we have the freedom to yell, we have to. Uh, but there was something fundamental about that right, uh, um, which did have limits. You couldn't just, um, uh, it did have boundaries. Um, but there was some margin of, of um, of being allowed to talk. So you, so you came in 2010 and you chose censorship as your subject. So yes. You, did that change? When, did you go back to Egypt after that immediately? Did you change your perception? Did anything change about your work? Yeah, it was July 31st. Jul July 31st, 2010 uh, is when I returned to, to Egypt. And um, I think that it was uh, it, it felt for me an incredibly suffocating environment. Mm -hmm. Part of it had to do with the freedom that you felt mentally and emotionally being in Oxford, mm -hmm. where you didn't have to um, be worried or watch your back. or Because even if there is a, a, a space for expression or a limited space for expression, mm -hmm. there are always the security agencies that you can be arrested randomly, you can be tortured. Um, you can be put on some kind of trial. Was the threat, the yeah, threat. yeah. There's always those pressures, and it's it's only when when you know when people can somehow expand those spaces that it, it changes. But there's still uh, there's still restrictions. Um, so it was a very suffocating space, but it wasn't just a suffocating space for for me. Uh, I think it was, you know, the the, the country was on the eve of a revolution. And part of it had to do with 
the space that was being opened up by social media uh, and uh, it becoming essentially the freest press in Egypt, which is Facebook at the time. And Facebook it wasn't so much, was a tool that, at, that, that was um, not by itself an organizing tool, but it, it, it told the public that, hey, you're not alone. That's incredibly powerful, yeah. Yeah. Uh, especially when dictatorship or authoritarian regimes try to atomize society, which is to say, uh, it had an impact. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, um, which is to say that, hey, you're alone. Like, if you think that there needs to be democracy or there needs to be a rule of law or, or the security agencies shouldn't have unbridled power to torture, beat, and detain, then you're just really alone. And, um, uh, and if you speak too loudly, then we have ways to, to keep you quiet. That was the magic of social media. Uh, that you're not alone. So when there was a call to protest on January 25th, 2000, I'm sorry. <laughs> when there was a call to protest on January 25th, 2011, people knew that they were not going to be alone. Um, that made a world of difference because you were able to reach critical mass. Mm -hmm. And then once you've reached critical mass, um, things can only get bigger. You know, people who were less afraid during the protest four days later became in, becoming the largest mass protest the country has ever seen. Um, fast forward a few years later, and and all of that has changed. The spaces that were opened up by, by popular protest have been closed down. And the, the, the regime has learned a lesson from uh, a popular ups uprising in 2010 that just didn't just sweep Egypt, but s swept uh, most of the Arab world. And uh, now, what the regime has learned is that it's, we can't let people talk because leading, letting people talk is one step short of having people act. But it's also this idea of um, um, reinstituting fear, but also creating this atomized society again. So if you do dissent, if you do dissent, are you, are you, uh, um, demand uh, freedoms, or you demand the rule of law, or you demand the security agencies that are um, um, that don't torture, or uh, or all these elements. If you if that's what you demand, then know that you're uh, you're going to be alone, um, and and that's another aspect of what's changed. But on, on, a, on another level also is that there is always direct censorship and there's indirect censorship. Uh, um, and indirect censorship could be um, uh, members of the security agencies calling a newspaper and saying, hey, we really don't like this story. I don't think you should publish it. And you get the hint, right? Uh, and then there's direct forms of censorship. And direct forms of censorship is what um, um, uh, the regime has used more often lately, which is uh, blocking internet websites, news websites, whether they're um, whether they're domestic or international, sometimes, uh, or whether they're uh, belong to a human rights agency. Uh, so that's an, a direct form of censorship. And they even went a step further, uh, which is have 
to have the security agencies own the media companies, so essentially businessmen who, who previously owned private satellite channels uh, are compelled to sell a majority stake in, in the media outlet. So what you've seen in your, since 1998 with, punctuated with your fellowship was, was, it was very difficult at the beginning. There was obviously always pressure and you came to Oxford, you felt the, the lifting of that, that pressure and then that was followed quite quickly with the, the increase in use of social media in Egypt and then you saw the impact of that but you're saying it's gone back now even possibly worse than 1998? It's much worse than I've ever yeah. seen it, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, 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 much, it's much worse than um, right now uh, in Egypt, it's much worse than at any time I've experienced. Um, and that makes it uh, incredibly difficult for um, for journalists in Egypt, in, including foreign journalists who are trying to, to do really honest reporting there because of um, the so many tools that are available now. When, when revolution broke out in 2011, social media has been seen as kind of like um, a forum um, for, to break that wall of censorship and in a way in some ways, a forum, a forum for organizing. And, um, but I think what's changed is that now social media or Facebook somehow uh, um, uh, state actors have kind of manipulated um, what was seen at the time as a liberating uh, force into a very um, restrictive, manipulative, um, uh, undemocratic uh, uh, force that does not help um, in, in, in kind of uh, realizing truth from fiction or um, uh, spreading the world word about uh, abuses. And it's always about a counter narrative and how how forcefully you can promote that counter narrative, especially in social media outlets that um, depend on profit. So if you pay for advertising you, in a certain way, you can manipulate so somehow the, the discussion that's happening on social media in a way that we've seen in, in, in the United States in the last election, for example. Well, thank you very much for sharing that incredible story and I'm sorry but it, it, it doesn't sound like a good time to be a journalist in Egypt now. Oh,